Please turn, if you would, in your copy of God's Holy Word to the book of Micah, uh, the sixth chapter. Uh, boys and girls, you might find it easier if you go to the book of Jonah and then go one book over forward in your Bible. Micah chapter 6, and this is, again, our Thanksgiving sermon. So we, in a Thanksgiving service, uh, after the supper, we do not dwell on the things that are required for our salvation, but the fruit of our salvation. Having seen the grace of God so rich in the supper, we walk in the grace of God, seeking to please our Lord in all things. Again, not for salvation, but as the fruit of it. So Micah 6, our uh, key verse here will be verse 8, which is a central verse for the Christian faith. But I will read the entirety of the chapter to get its context. Micah 6, verse 1. This is now the word of the Lord. Hear ye now what the Lord saith. Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. O my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim, unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Now here's especially our sermon text. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? Are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked, and the scant measure that is abominable? Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? For the rich men thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee, in making thee desolate because of thy sins. Thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied, and thy casting down shall be in the midst of thee, and thou shalt take hold, but shalt not deliver." And that which thou deliverest will I give up to the sword. Thou shalt sow, but thou shalt not reap. Thou shalt tread the olives, but thou shalt not anoint thee uh, with oil and sweet wine, but shalt not drink wine. For the statutes of Omri are kept and all the works of the house of Ahab. And ye walk in their counsels that I should make thee a desolation and the inhabitants thereof an hissing. Therefore, ye shall bear the reproach of my people. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray for the preaching. O God of heaven, we come now to the preached word, and we come to such a pivotal text as this, and all we can do is plead that uh, in the preaching of the word, it would be the Holy Spirit who would work through the minister. We plead for the Spirit, Father, to come down and visit us, Uh, through the word of God as it is preached. For we need the Spirit's help, Father. Uh, What a challenge a text like this is to our souls. Even the redeemed, Lord, we often do not want to walk humbly with our God. And so would you smash the pride of man that is here, that we would walk with humility before God all the days of our life. And we pray then for the ears that will hear, the hearts that are here, that they would be opened to the preaching of the word. And we pray, O God, that you would do this, that Christ would increase and we would all diminish and we would see the glory of our Savior. So as we come to the text, Father, and it preached, we pray and plead, open thou our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our theme this afternoon deals with both 
being good and doing good. And for some reason, many Reformed people today, uh, Christian people, seem allergic to this very idea that the Christian is both to be good and do good. That the regenerated soul can be good and do good by the Holy Spirit's power. This is the fruit of a regenerated heart, to be able to do that which is good. And not only are we able to do what is good, according to God, but Christ, here's the thing, expects it of us. James 4.17, if you feel like I'm in the Old Testament and uh, you have a wrong view of the Old Testament, let me just tell you what James says in your New Testament. James 4.17 plainly says, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Uh, God has the same expectation as Micah 6 verse 8 in the New Testament. He's very clear on these things, that God expects the Christian to know what is good, and he will define that for us today, and also to be good. And this is our reasonable service, beloved. Not again, as has been prayed so fervently, to earn our salvation, and not either to maintain our salvation, but really the fruit and the byproduct of the saved soul that desires, and here's the thing, to walk closely with Jesus Christ as a response to his mercy out of thankfulness for all that the Lord has done for us. And this great motivator, right, of the love of Christ is what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, constraineth us or compels us, right? For the love of Christ constraineth us that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. In other words, the Christian humbles themselves before God to no longer live for themselves, but to live for the one who died for them, who loved them, and rose again from the dead. And you have seen, right, this is why it's called a Thanksgiving service uh, historically, you have seen this morning the love of Christ on display at the Lord's table. And what does that love then constrain us to do, right? Right? If you've seen the love of Christ, it constrains you not. This is a constraint put upon you by God. Not to live for yourself, but for the one that you saw broken before your very eyes as though crucified before you. And this text is a foundational text here in Micah 6 verse 8. It is a foundational text in many confessions of faith, in many commentaries on the faith itself. And we really should have a great interest in the text, right? Because he asks you the question, what doth the Lord require of thee? And he expects you to know the answer. What does he require of you, right? He's very plain here. And every Christian has to know the answer to the question. So this is a foundational text before us. It is meant to be memorized. It is meant to be studied. It is meant to be meditated upon. It is very critical for the Christian life because God himself says it. And this text, if nothing else, will teach you that the Christian is to study what is good. He is to know or she is to know what is good. And then he or she is to be good. As a response, as you'll see the flow of the text as we have read it, as a response to the mercies of God that they have received in Christ. And by grace received, as you have received in the supper, you are to exercise it by walking in such ways. And so with that introduction, our theme is this. Christ has revealed what is good, and we must both study it and practice it by his help. Christ has revealed what is good, and we must both study it and practice it by his help. And we'll consider this under three heads. First is you must consider what is good. Second, you must see what is good. And third, you must practice what is good. So first... Let us consider our first heading, which is consider what is good. Now, our text brings us in the midst of a controversy that the Lord has with his church. Uh, Boys and girls, uh, the prophet Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah. Uh, If you look at Micah 1.1 and you compare it with Isaiah 1.1, you will find that they uh, served the Lord under several of the same kings, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, um, and so on. And so the word that comes to the Lord, uh, from the Lord to Micah uh, is about 130 years before the Babylonian exile. And he warns them to turn from their evil ways and to practice righteousness. Now, 
Solemnly, you know, this word was not heard. Uh, It was heard, but it was not heeded, rather, because Judah would go into exile about 130 years later. Now, you might ask then the question, and this is a question we don't ask ourselves. Why is this word in the Bible? Is it to remember a sad bit of history, a prophet who seemingly failed in delivering the word of God, which he, of course, did not, even though the people did not respond and turn to the Lord? That's not why it's here. It is here to warn the church of Jesus Christ that judgment begins in the house of God. And the very same moral obligations that are laid upon our forefathers are laid upon us as well. Paul said what in 1 Corinthians 10.6? This is a foundational text too. When speaking of judgments on the Old Testament saints, now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. In other words, you draw a straight line, children of God, from Micah, from the Exodus, from Numbers, or any other place in the Old Testament when you see them lust for evil things. We are to turn away from those things as they lusted and found judgment. And so as time is of the essence tonight, and this is not, and we're not committed to a series on Micah, uh, I want to dive into the controversy of this text, which deals with what God truly desires of us, his people, because we are so prone to wanting to give God that which he does not want and to ignore the things that he does want. And he shows us here what service is actually acceptable in his sight. We are prone to perform religious acts, even extravagant ones, that he has not asked for, and instead, right, ignore the things he has shown us. Why? To assage our consciences, right? Uh, Because what we really want is sin. And if we can make up our own goodness, if we can make up those things that we feel like we can keep, and even ceremonies that we can keep, well, then it makes it very easy to put away what God has actually asked for the things that are hard on our flesh that we need the grace of God for. So in verses 6 and 7, you can see this. In the midst of a controversy the Lord has with his people, they are speaking back to him, as it were, with a singular voice, and asks him, what do you want of us, right? And this shows you the problem in the heart of God's people in verses 6 and 7. Wherewith shall I, and this is the people speaking as one, come before the Lord, And bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? You see, the Lord has a controversy with his people, right? And he says, hear my controversy. And the people with uh, uh, dullness of mind and heart, they respond, what shall we do, God? Shall we come with extravagant sacrifices? Shall I even come and give you the firstborn, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? In other words, Lord, are you going to be pacified with these outward rites and ceremonies? Let me give you thousands of burnt offerings. Let me give you the equivalent of vast sums of money today, and I can give you even my child. What are they doing in that? And why is the displeasure of the Almighty kindled at that? You know, there's a sense of disgust that the Almighty has with professing believers like this. And what is happening is very subtle. It comes into all of our hearts, and it is vital for us to understand this controversy. You know, first of all, they're twisting God's sacrificial system, which was meant to atone for their sin, right? It it is given as a grace to them, Uh, Even so, they're corrupting it in their application most heinously with child sacrifices. So they're not even keeping it the way uh, the sacrificial system ought to be kept. But they're actually missing the point entirely of the sacrifices, aren't they? The sacrificial system was provided for their sin, yes. But at the end of the day, was it the sacrifices that God was after? Is it the sacrifices he's after? No. No. What did he want from them? Uh, Do you know what he wanted from them? And do you know what he wants from you as well, child of God? He wants their heart, and he wants their heartfelt obedience. This is what he wants. He wanted them, out of love to him, to be good and to do good. He had already shown them this, and this is one of the reasons why he has shown you what is good in 1 Samuel 15, 22. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. 
Right? This is what he is after. And it is this fundamental and foundational principle that undergirds the entirety of this text, right? He he wanted them to, and here's the verb, humbly walk in verse 8. And with whom? With him. Right? This is what he wants of him. He doesn't want you to paper, and me either, to paper over our evil with ceremonies and rituals, right? Certainly not those he has never asked for. And so this is the fundamental, this is the practical principle that every Christian must know. It is very tempting to assage our conscience with outward ceremonies than to actually do what God wants, right? By God's grace. And this is why you will find, and I'm going to link this theme to a couple weeks ago, why in the church you often find crazy ceremonies and then multiplied. Uh, Things the Lord has never asked for. You might even put yourself into verses 6 and 7. Why is there a thing called Lent? Why is there a Mass? Why are there a multitude of other superstitions that have plagued the church? Because of the principle of this text. It is easy to assage this conscience with ceremony rather than actually do what God has said is good and right in His eyes. And this is the temptation we must all be aware of, friends. You know, in in God's wisdom, God's uh, worship is prescribed as merely as what he commands to minimize this temptation. As he says, he hath shown thee, O man, what is good. And one of the reasons, as I mentioned in our sermon on preaching, you find in very liturgical churches, uh, in their church services, a multiplication of unauthorized ceremonies and so-called holy days is because man wants to assage his conscience so that he doesn't actually have to give up his evil through a pretense of ceremonies and rituals, right? And that's what's happening in verses 6 and 7. But I would just say to you, uh, Reformed Presbyterians, uh, you cannot totally remove this temptation even with the regular principle of worship, right? Lest you think, and I think either, that we are safe, brethren, that we celebrated communion with a common cup, right? We only will sing the psalms in worship, and so then what? We can live like heathen? No, Uh, We ignored the plain precept, be ye holy, for I am holy uh, at our own peril, right? In other words, uh, just be mindful of this. You can use your church attendance. You can use coming to prayer meetings. You can uh, even think of coming to the Lord's table and use those things as a cloak for evil, right? You can be proud of the church services and the church that you're part of and so on and so forth and still use that as a, pre- as a pretense for doing evil. So let's connect this text to ourselves as we think of our Lord Jesus' sacrifice. Uh, you saw it at the Lord's Supper, right? Uh, Christ broken and bleeding for our sin to forgive us. You know, can we simply plead the sacrifice of Christ and have absolutely no interest in being good and doing what is right in God's eyes. No. You know, it's very easy to fool yourself, beloved, that you are drawing near to God while as a matter of fact you are walking away from Him. Right? He says, humbly walk with thy God. And it's very easy when we are disobedient, right, to the Lord, to fool ourselves, I came to the Lord's table. And then you walk and you live as a heathen. Are you really in communion with the Lord? No, right? And let us remember, uh, let me give you two more witnesses, right, that you are not saved from sin to walk in sin. Romans 6, 1 through 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Right? If you have said, right, I am crucified with Christ, you are dead to sin. How can you walk any longer therein? Or more solemnly in Galatians 2.17, and this has been a verse that often has such gravity that we ignore. But if while while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. You know, child of God, would you live for what he suffered and died to free you from? And would you then, as you continue to walk in sin and say, you know what, Christ, he'll forgive everything, right? And of course, we know, tender conscience, that Christ will forgive everything, but a a soul who is presumptuous in that way, who'll say, I can just go on sinning, because Christ has forgiven me. That presumptuous sinner, 
right, is what he is saying or she is saying is Christ is the minister of sin. That Christ, and this is a blasphemous thought, right, enables my sin. And that is an awful, horrifying thought that the child of God ought to put away, right? If we love Jesus instead, the love of Christ constrains us, is what the apostle says, that we should no longer live for ourselves, but we should live for him. And how do we live for him? We live for him in holiness. We give our lives as a living sacrifice consecrated to him. Romans 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, right? There's that word, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That should show you and provide enough witnesses to you to prove the doctrine of Micah 6 verse 8. He has shown you, O man, that which is good. What does he require of you to, but to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? Now, I want to be very plain again. Our text does not speak of how we are saved. We are saved entirely by the work of Christ Right, who forgave our sin, imputes his righteousness to us by which we receive by faith alone. Right, even in our text in verse 4, God reminds them that the, he had already saved them and redeemed uh, his people. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of servants, out of slavery, out of bondage. He has reminded them that not only then, he has saved them time and again. He reminds them of Balak as well after that. He is the God who saves his people unilaterally. When we were without strength, Christ saved us. And we are saved because Christ is the one who keeps the precept here of doing justly, love mercy, and walking humbly with his God. He did that all the time. Yes, very good. That is our gospel hope as we heard this morning. But, beloved, we are constrained to walk in the same manner, right? He uh, he that loves the Lord is to walk even as he walked, right? So we cannot have eternal life by being good in this way, but this text is about the fruit of our salvation, how the saved person lives, summed up by what? Holiness unto the Lord, refusing to use the precious blood of Christ as a cloak for wickedness, uh, a pretense for wickedness. Now, of course, we are covered by his blood and we plead it whenever we sin. But what we have to get straight is we can't use it as a, a cloak for darkness. And that's something you must commit yourself to, especially after the supper, beloved. So let's, with that understanding, consider our next heading, which is see what is good. Now, in verse 8, this key verse for all that would call on the name of the Lord, it says, He has shown thee, O man, what is good. And in other words, what he has said is he has shown you what you need to do and to be in order to be good. The questions that were asked in verses 6 and 7 about sacrifices, right? You know, these sort of perplexing questions that they ask. What do you require of us? Do you require these extravagant things? Uh, they should have known better than to even ask the questions. As I mentioned in 1 Samuel 15, to obey is better than sacrifice. God has shown them in the scriptures, in the word of God, what he requires of them and of us. What does that teach you, beloved? That you need the word of God. You need the word of God to know how to do good. Uh, the scriptures alone are sufficient and plain in teaching what God requires. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and young uh, boys and girls, I hope you have memorized this or know it at least, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in what? Righteousness, isn't it? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto what? All good works. Right? Isn't that what he is saying here? He has shown you, O man, that which is good. It's not far from us, is it? It's very near to us. It's right here on the pages that most of you have laid out on your laps right now. Everything you need for the service of God is found in the Bible and in the Bible only. 
whether it is for the worship of God as we are worshiping now or how to live righteously. All is found here in these words. He has shown you what is good. You know, in other words, there is no point in you asking, how do I live for Jesus? What will I do? What shall I render unto the Lord? Right? Shall I make up or can I figure out what is good in his eyes? No, you can't ask that if you will not pick up and read. Tole lege, right? Take and read. That was what was obnoxious about the people of God and our own sin as well in Micah's day. They did not need to invent anything. They most certainly and most definitely had no need to go and sacrifice their children, which if they had taken and read the word of God would have known as an abomination to the Lord. They wouldn't even mention it in jest. Though in that we do remind ourselves that the Lord has provided the sacrifice we need for our sin. Right, that he gave his only be- beloved, his only begotten son. He's given his firstborn. So we never dare ask the question: Shall we render our firstborn to the Lord? Right, he's given his firstborn, and you take and read and see that too. You know, in Micah's day, they would have known that. Right, the sacrifice of God. You know, not only is it a, a bo- broken uh, and contrite spirit and heart, but they would have seen Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering servant who would be the sin bearer, sacrifice for the sins of his people. He says, I have taken care of the sacrifice that you need. When I bring my firstborn into the world to be slain for God's people, as you saw at the table, that even in Genesis 3, I have shown you that my son The seed of the woman would be bruised for the iniquities of my people. Tole lege indeed. He's taken care of the sacrifice, child of God, such that as we glory this morning, there is now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. But out of that salvation, he wants you to be good. He's declared you righteous in his sight, imputing Christ's righteousness to you. And by Christ's own power in the sacrament received, he wants you to be righteous. And he wants no inventions from you on how to be good. He doesn't want invented good works and pilgrimages and ceremonies he has never appointed. He has shown you, O man. He has shown you, O woman, what is good. Do that. Instead of ignoring what he has said and then inventing your own righteousness. It is your solemn duty to begin here and mine too, to see what he has shown you. If he has shown you, you must see what he has said. You must know the word of God. You must study the word of God and not abstractly so. You must see the word of God. You must see what is good and you must see your own life and you are to examine your life in view of it. You know, not just peer at the word of God as an ordinary book, but in some ways you are to put yourself in the scales against the word of God and you are to measure it. Uh, against you. You have to ask yourself, where is my life in comparison to this word? Where am I in the balance and found wanting? Right? And wherever that is, I am to repent by God's grace and have new obedience by his grace as well. Remember, he has shown you what is good. And we say, right, when we are saved, we are in union with Jesus Christ. We are in union with the one who is good. Right? And as we say, we ask for the light of the word by Christ and our union with Christ to penetrate the recesses of our soul so that we would become more and more conformed to the image of our blessed Savior. And this really is the motivating principle right, for the Christian. Uh, he has shown us what is good really by showing us Jesus Christ, who is goodness incarnate. This morning, when we saw what is good on the cross, Right, It was praying for our enemies, right, doing good to them that hate you and revile you and so on. And what did we do when we saw that? Right, We saw what is good in the flesh, so to speak, in Christ our Lord. And so this is what motivates the Christian. Yes, the love of Christ constrains us. But also we meditate on the beauty of the Lord and we are captivated by his character. And we say, I want to be like my Savior. And I can be through my union with Christ, right? And you think of our Savior and you look at him in the words of Scripture. Is it not his character? Is it not his love that captivates you most of all? Right? The love he shows to both God and neighbor. 
Uh, and, and is Christ not in fact the very incarnated word of God? You know, I, I fear that some of us look at this as a very, very severe book, the Bible, instead of looking upon it in view of Christ, that he is the word of God made flesh come to dwell among us. And how could we ever then see this as a severe book? This is the most glorious book because it is, uh, in a sense, uh, filled with the imprint of Christ and the character of our Savior, right? This morning he asked for forgiveness from those, uh, uh, not from those, uh, of those who crucified them, that God would forgive them, right? And we saw that this was a precept in the Bible, right? And, and so if we long to forgive those who have done us evil, all we have to do is look where? At Christ and say, I desire to be like him because he is good, right? And then don't we love the word that says we are to forgive men, their trespasses. Why do we love it? Because that's Christ's nature and character revealed, right? What has he said? The heart of the law of God is love and love is the heart of Christ. And so to look upon the law of God is to peer into the very heart of Jesus Christ. And that ought to be the great motivator to look and see uh, what the Lord has said is good. Christ is ever the great motivator for the Christian. But then you are to put into practice the word, which is our final heading. In the next part of verse 8, we find God's summation of what he requires of us. This is quite challenging. And what doth the, uh, the Lord require of thee? but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. In other words, this is a summary, and you must take it that way as another summary of what he has shown you in the word of God in how to live, how to be good. And if you want God's teaching of what his Bible says concerning righteousness, you ought to perk up and take note, for here it is, here it is. What does he show us? We are to do justly, we are to love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. And let me first treat the two portions that come first briefly. Do justly and love mercy. Now, it's no surprise to us, and you've probably heard this, the liberal Christian right, loves this verse for all the wrong reasons. For all the wrong reasons. Uh, they seek to change the truth of God's word into something like social justice, right? And they say, see, look, God requires justice and mercy. But they neglect to remember what he has said. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. He has shown you in the Bible what justice is and what mercy is. You don't invent these things, right? The word of God tells you what true justice is and what true mercy is. And so you can't use this fragment of a verse, even in its very immediate context, to support something like wokeism, right? Or something like that, any sort of these perversions of true justice. Um, because it is in. Uh, delibly connected to he hath showed thee, O man, what is good. For instance, if he has shown you that marriage is good in being between one man and one woman, he has shown you what is good. If he has shown you that homosexuality is an abomination and is wicked, well, how can you ever support a so-called gay rights agenda with this text? and speak of social justice. You can't, because he has shown you what is good, and homosexuality and transgenderism is not that. You know, what liberal Christians are in the habit of doing is actually to say the very same things that the people of Micah did, except with a different emphasis. They invent their own righteousness to assuage their conscience and guilt before God, right? But that is no righteousness, because it is not what God has shown you is good. And in so doing... And this is the solemn thing and why we oppose such things, right? They are consigning all who believe their wicked message, not to heaven, but to hell. And that's the solemnity of it. Because, right, when they have their so-called wokeism and uh, social justice, uh, they never, ever exhort the sinner to take Christ and to be forgiven of all their sins and trespasses. And they never, ever, right, uh, plead with them to have a new heart that loves what is truly good that God has shown us. And the devil must be laughing at their folly as liberals neither save themselves nor those who hear them, which is the opposite, of course, of what Paul told Timothy. Right? Instead, they consign both themselves and their hearers to hell. On the other hand, 
those of us who seek at times to be very biblical, we who know the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we who preach the truth that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that, that all must repent and turn to the Lord for mercy from their wicked ways, even as we read in Ezekiel in the scripture reading, we who say that there is salvation in no other name but Christ only, we ourselves often neglect the fact that God has said, do justly and love mercy. And that's really the chastisement on us. You know, these second table duties we owe men, that's a terrible thought, isn't it? That we ourselves are often guilty of this, uh, of not doing justly and not loving mercy. We are not to fall into that evil, even as James exhorted us in his own epistle. We are to care for justice. We are to love mercy and not run to condemnation first and foremost. And so first, here he says in this triad, you and I are to do justly. And what that means, briefly speaking, is we are to be fair and just with all that we deal with, believer and unbeliever alike. There is no respect of persons in God's economy when it comes to these things, right? I once knew a man who felt pervertedly, to pervert rather the word of God, that he could lie to unbelievers with impunity. No. We are to do justly to all, right? Consider what the people of Micah's time were doing in verse 11. Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and the bag of deceitful ways, uh, weights? That's injustice, isn't it? Plain and simple. We are to be just in every dealing we have, right? We are to use fair and equal measures in everything that we do. And the mistake you would make is to think this is speaking just purely financially. Of course, it's financial. But it also comes uh, to matters of justice, broadly speaking, right? We are not to have one measure for one group of people, or even ourselves, and we'll get to that in a moment, and then for another. We are to have equal measures when it comes to all things. Um, we are not to skirt the rules, right, when it comes to an advantage, right? Uh, not doing justly to one party because we don't like them so much, and then being very easy on another because they're our friends, Right? Uh, for instance, we'll have a synod meeting in about a week. And what uh, great temptations there are in our courts, even among godly men uh, who come there, is that it is sometimes very convenient. We're tempted, rather, I should say this. We seek to go against this. It, it, the temptation is to conveniently forget certain rules that apply when, when it would advantage another party and then apply them to ourselves when we feel we would get the advantage. Right? This is unjust. This is not doing justly, right? We are to apply the rules of the word equally to all parties, regardless of faction, even to our, and this is the thing, our own hurt. When there's a time that comes and the temptation comes, well, if I don't talk about this or if I don't reveal this, then it'll be to my advantage, right? No, I am to do justly, most especially when it concerns me. And even when it comes to things that uh, would injure us, even if it means there will be less in the bank account, when my cause might seem to be put uh, at a setback, right? We are not to care about that. God will take care of the cause. We are to care, take care of doing justly. We do what is just. And keeping with the theme of the text, we are not to say, well, no big deal, because, well, I'll give, you know, and this is, I'm thinking financially especially, right? I'm unjust. I'll make a little bit more money. You know what? It's okay, because I'm going to tithe on the money that I'm going to bring in unjustly, so it'll help the kingdom. Isaiah 61.8 says to that, For I, the Lord, love judgment, that is justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. Uh, in, in that time, right, seeing in like they were robbing so that they could have more to give as burnt offerings. I hate that, the Lord says. Right? Don't think that you can be unjust, you can take and you can steal and then assage your conscience. Right? This is the whole point of this text. I'm going to assage my conscience by giving a lot to God. He has no interest in that. What are you doing? You make God out to be a party to your thievery. And he has no, nothing to do with that. He doesn't want your blood offering. Then he says, love mercy. You constrain yourself to do what is right and what is just, but in your dealings with men, you are to love mercy, to be merciful, right? To do good to others. The contrast is in verse 12. For the rich men thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. 
You know, this morning you saw it. You saw it on the cross. The Lord has told us to be tender and pitiful to all men, even loving our enemies. And, you know, even as he tells us to love mercy, is it not striking that our Lord Jesus never asks us to do anything that he himself will not do, that he himself is not himself? You know, you think on this wicked people in Micah, people not unlike them, uh, ourselves, right? You know, after chastising them in this chapter, what do you see in the very next chapter? In uh, Micah 7, verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever. Why? Because he delighteth in mercy. He tells you love mercy. But he has said, more importantly, he delights in mercy. And you are to delight in mercy because he is a God that delights in mercy himself. You know, our gospel hope is rooted in the character and nature of a God that delights in mercy. Even, right, you think on these people so wicked and wayward in Micah's day. But he says, I will to a remnant of these wicked people show my mercy. And so why are you to love mercy? Right? Why are you to love mercy to other men? Because your God delights in mercy and has shown you mercy. Hasn't he? Right? You who deserve wrath, Christian, me too. We have received mercy, not from a God who hates to show mercy. Could you imagine if God hated showing mercy? We would all be lost. But he is a God that delights to show mercy, even to his own hurt which he showed you, O oh man, when God incarnate laid his life down for you on the cross. Because why? Can't you make Micah 7.18 apply to our Savior? He delights in mercy. It's why he didn't save himself. He delights in mercy. The why his first words on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He delighted to save you out of his merciful heart. And then you think on the parable of the debtors. He is so merciful and he is so full in his salvation, even forgiving the sin of uh, crucifying God. What does he say to those who will not delight in mercy? The parable of the debtor tells you exactly why. The debtors tells you why, what he thinks. Oh, wicked servant. And Psalm 1826 reminds you, with the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful. Take up James and hear James 2.13. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, but mercy rejoiceth against judgment. As the Savior promised in the Beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You know, the heart of the Christian towards personal offense is mercy. A willingness to forgive, Right? knowing that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And I think what is most convicting here in this text, at least for me, in do justly and love mercy, is that we often are in the habit of not loving our neighbor as ourselves. Let me explain. This is what we want for ourselves from others, right? That they would love mercy and they would do justly towards us, right? But what we are in the habit of doing is loving mercy for ourselves and wanting justice done to others, especially in matters of transgressions against ourselves, right? Uh, it's always mercy for me and judgment for you. And what we are to do is we are to love mercy not just for ourselves, but also towards others. We are not so keen on doing what is just to others as well, giving them their due, uh, what they uh, what is obligated to them. And maybe this is why Christ's simple golden rule is the most convicting rule of all. And this is why we so greatly needed Christ this morning. But he did give us a new heart if we are born again to love these things and desire these things to do justly and love mercy. These deal with second table matters of what God requires of us of loving neighbor. But the verse culminates with walk humbly with thy God. And that deals especially with first table matters of loving God. Now, the imagery here of walking with the Lord is very potent, or it's meant to be. And for those who love the Lord, as we have pledged that we do, it is meant to be motivating. You know, you who said you enjoyed communion with the Lord this morning, 
because you loved that the Lord had come very close, right? This is what you had said in your heart. The, love, uh, the Lord has come very close to me. He has come down from heaven and he has met me at the table and I have had communion with the Lord Most High and you loved that he was near you. Now, I guess the shocking thing would be, why then would we not walk with him? if we actually say these things, right? Because what does walking with him imply? That we are very near to him, right? If we have had communion, which we have desired, how do you maintain fellowship with Christ, brethren, but by walking with him? It absolutely makes no sense, and you show yourself to be the double-minded uh, man or woman when you say, I want communion at the table, but as far as walking with Christ, being near to him, not so much. And it actually shows that we are hypocrites, isn't it? You know, when you think of Enoch, right, what do you think of? You think of the man who walked with God, right? And I was thinking about this. Almost every question I have from others about Enoch is about the fact that he never died. Instead of thinking, wow, this man walked with God so closely. How did Enoch do that, pastor? How did he manage that? Instead, our curiosity is tickled, isn't it? What is it? Did the man die? Did his body go to the grave? Was he taken up in soul only? Did his, was he resurrected? And so on and so forth. The questions come. But not about walking with God. And I think that kind of tells us where we are. Not so much interested in walking with God, but having our curiosity itched. And see, when we come to the, uh, the Bible, especially as Reformed Christians, right? Sometimes we're just more curious about this, that, and the other thing. And as far as walking with God, which is what God requires of thee, uh, not so much. Uh, you need to understand, and I need to too, that we are called to walk closely with God. This is what distinguishes true religion from false. True religion is about communion and union and fellowship with Christ. And what makes following the word of God a joy and not a chore is that we are walking with Jesus Christ and we are following after him. As I've mentioned, is he not the very word of God, beloved? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, right? And when you follow the word of God, you are walking with Christ himself. And that fact should change our perception of the word and the law of God. We walk with Christ. And he says, not just walk. There's a tenor here. Walk humbly, right? You're not to be the pride-filled person who has a thought in their mind that they know better than the word of God, right? That's pride. You will never walk with the Lord if you do not submit your conscience, you don't submit your heart to the very word of God, right? There are many here, uh, not saying here, there are many Christians, and maybe here, who often uh, think that they know better than God, saying things like this, well, I believe God is going to accept this and that. And the other thing, I believe what God wants of me is this or that. I believe God wants me to, and you hear this all the time, divorce my husband or divorce my wife. But he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And you are to humble yourself under the word of God and walk with God, Right? Many defy the counsel of God who will not submit their will to the Lord. They do not walk with Christ, no matter how much they might claim otherwise. He has said he resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. And what was the devil's sin? Wasn't it pride that caused him his downfall, right? Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. 1 Timothy 3.6, right? Pride as as has long been said by many men, is the very sin that turned angels into demons. Why? Because they would not walk with God. Something to remember as you consider this so-called Pride Month. The contrast, again, is seen in our text. Consider verse 16. Rather than walk with God, we read, For the statutes of Omri are kept, and all the works of the house of Ahab, and ye, here's the word, walk in their counsels that I should make thee a desolation and the inhabitants thereof an hissing. Therefore, ye shall bear the reproach of my people. What does he say to the people here? You don't walk with God. You walk in whose counsel? Ahab's and Omri's. And boys and girls, you know this from your Old Testament. You know what wicked men these were. 
You know, the Bible doesn't record Omri, who's Ahab's father, as much, but he records in the Bible Ahab very much having the prophets of Baal, right? Desecrating both tables of the law, idolatry enshrined in the high places, persecuting the true prophets like Elijah. And so judgment is being threatened here in Micah's day as it was in Ahab's. He says, you will not do justly, you will not love mercy, you will not walk with God. I should make thee a desolation and the inhabitants thereof and hissing. And the land was, wasn't it? They would be captives for 70 years, 130 years hence from Micah's day. And what we have to realize as we think on this text then is the truth that judgment begins in the house of God. Right? And we are all called to walk humbly with our God. Lest this desolation come upon us. You look at all of the terrible things happening in the church. You look at the persecution even now in the West against God's people. Can we not see that a huge portion of this is because we do not do justly, we don't love mercy, and we most certainly are not walking humbly with our God? (sighs) You know, he was very merciful to preserve a remnant and restore them because he delights in mercy and he cannot deny himself. But beloved, just as it was for them, he can bring us very, very low. And a remnant indeed will be what is preserved, a remnant. We have to take heed lest we fall, right, brethren? Right, this morning at the Lord's table, we heard the words of warning that he does bring judgment into the house of God. Many are asleep. Many had received a chastisement from the Lord from coming to the supper in a way that was not humble, in a way that uh, they had defied the Lord's commandments to do justly and walk humbly with their God, to love mercy. And so, of course, he brings chastisement on them. And many slept, that is, many died. And you have to see this, beloved, that we ourselves can fall under his chastisement. We are to walk humbly with Christ our Lord. He is our Lord, not just our Savior. And what I want you to see again is that to walk with him is actually no real sacrifice at all. And that would be the mistake that we would make, right? But you need to think of it this way. Would you think of it this way as you get up today and you go out into the world? That it is not a sacrifice to walk with God, with Christ, but it is fellowship. But it is fellowship. You walk with him, right? This is what distinguishes the Christian faith. We walk with Christ, right? And and so to follow the word of God, even when it is difficult, even when doing justly and loving mercy comes at a great cost, when walking humbly with the Lord causes us to... um, to, to have pain in this world, maybe. Maybe we lose things in this world. Maybe people who said they were our friends are no longer our friends. Maybe a hard word of rebuke will have to come to somebody because we cannot countenance their sin. Whatever it is, it is far better to walk with Christ. And that's the way you have to see it, especially as it causes us to wound our flesh, right? You need to see that walking with the Lord is what makes to us the creature obedience better than sacrifice. You are near him. And if you are near him, and this is why we ought never fear obedience, even if it seems to come at a cost, we are near him. And if you are near him, you are near his safety. You are near his refuge. He is our fortress. And it is very good, we say, as it was at the Mount of Transfiguration, to be near the Lord and to walk with him. Again, we are often captivated with Enoch for the wrong reason. He went up without death. Okay, sure. But he walked with God, meaning he had fellowship with God. And so he goes to heaven where he now has an intimate communion with God every moment of his eternal life. And that is what Enoch teaches us most of all. How far our heart is when we are so interested in a man who did not die, rather than marvel and rejoice and long for a man who walked with God. And this is not too far from you. It is a walk that can be yours by faith and by the grace of God. And don't get me wrong. There are many things we can learn from the fact that Enoch was taken, right? I'm just saying our emphasis is in the wrong place. Go dive into the deep things of God, but don't neglect the the, the things, uh, the first works, as Jesus said, which is to walk with him. 
And know that to be near Christ, the blessing of that is the blessing of obedience. Well, as you heard at the start of our communion season, if you have found him this week, or you found him at the supper, right? You are to grasp him as the bride did and never let him go. Walking humbly with him is one way you do that and how you maintain the communion that you had this morning at the Lord's Supper. If you have found a standing with God in Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, having such a standing, you are to walk humbly with Christ day by day. And that is the Christian's The Bible calls it reasonable service and how reasonable it is as a response to salvation being entirely of the Lord. And so this is our thanksgiving to the Lord, remembering that it is the love of Christ that constrains us, even as we have celebrated the gospel feast this morning, that the love of Christ constrains us now to walk with him and to live for him. Amen. May God bless you and me too with a warm walk with Jesus. Let us arise and attend to prayer. O Lord, our God, you have shown us many things in the scripture today, both the mercy of God, uh, the love of God, and also the obedience that we owe God as a life lived for the Savior. Help us to live lives crucified for Christ, that we would put ourselves to death, that we would walk humbly with our God, and help us to enjoy it as fellowship with Christ, even when it comes uh, at a great cost to our flesh. May we rejoice in that. When we lose things in this world to walk with Christ, may we rejoice in that, that we were counted worthy to suffer for his name, And uh, when we suffer even the reproach of family members for walking close with Christ, may we rejoice in that as well, knowing that to be with Christ is far better, that to walk humbly with him is the place, the true place of safety and refuge. May you then bring our wills in conformity to the Lord Jesus, and may we look on him as he that is good, and may we then look upon him that is good and resolve to do good and be good, knowing that for those of us who know to do good and doeth it not, to us it is sin. But let us resolve to live this way by the grace of God and not the flesh, that we may live lives that are pleasing to God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.